practicing the biblical principles of the Catholic faith and manifesting the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is Receiving the Word with Father Todd Braggs. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and every expression of wickedness, and receive with meekness the engrafted Word which is able to save your souls. Good morning, my dear brothers and sisters. Today, liturgically speaking, it is the 16th Sunday after Trinity, and I am basing my sermon today upon St. Paul's epistle written to the Ephesians, which I will read to you right now with your kind permission. I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Here endeth the epistle. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, my dear friends in our Lord Jesus Christ, in this small section of this third chapter of St. Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, which began in verse 13, I do believe, there is so much for us to take away from what I just read to you. There is so much packed into what St. Paul writes in this epistle, and the reason, quite frankly, that there is so much to discern and to take away from it is because, quite frankly, St. Paul is truly writing this epistle, epistle meaning a letter. He is writing this epistle with such zeal, fervent zeal, why do I say that? Because bear in mind, at that time, the world, again, was filled, if you will, with utter chaos. People were doing what they wanted to do. People were not listening to any authority figure. Again, there was also division running rampant throughout the world, division of nation versus nation, division concerning man versus man, even division within man himself, not knowing what to do, not knowing what way to go. And so this was the theme, if you will, or, or what was going on around the world. And then secondarily, keep in mind, dear friends, St. Paul was writing this epistle, this letter, while he was a prisoner. Next week's epistle, I think, is taken from chapter 4, and we hear in verse, or chapter 4, verse 1, of this same epistle that we're studying, that we're reading from, St. Paul writes, 
I write as the prisoner of the Lord. Because again, he was writing this epistle to his spiritual children at Ephesus, literally and figuratively, if you will, in bonds. He was chained up in prison and figuratively he couldn't see his children, reach out to them physically, be with them physically. And so this is why St. Paul is writing this epistle because, as I stated, he sees so much chaos in the world and he himself is a prisoner, unable to be with them and to urge them to understand what is truly important to know as a Christian. This is why he says further on what I read to you here. He says, And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. You see, dear friends, as I like to preach on it, I find myself preaching more and more and more about it because, again, it, it just seems to affect all of us, including me. How can we have, as St. Paul says here, the fullness of God if we are filled with things of the world? And so St. Paul also as well is a firm believer in this because this is the exact thing that he's trying to preach to the church at Ephesus and is trying to preach to us as well some 2,000 years later. You should be filled with the fullness of God. I'd like to point out, if you will, a couple verses here in this section that we just read for special emphasis sake. The first one is verse 14. St. Paul writes, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, as I described the time period in which St. Paul lived, the time period in which he found himself being constrained while in prison, the time period, if you will, the frame of mind of the world in general, as I described it in utter chaos, division between all kinds of folks, again, a, a, a disregard, if you will, for right and wrong. You know, you've heard that saying, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Obviously, what I just described 2,000 years ago is certainly what we are experiencing right now. Chaos in the streets, especially here in the United States, but throughout the world to a certain degree, a disregard, disregard meaning totally not caring between what is right or what is wrong, and division among people. This is why, again, St. Paul is our, and let me read it again, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when St. Paul uses this term, I bow my knees, remember, for the Jewish person, the ultimate symbol, if you will, of prayer would be one of prostration, meaning not only bowing the knees, but totally prostrating ourselves again before the Almighty, showing, in other words, ultimate humility. 
acknowledging God's greatness, acknowledging the kingship of God, acknowledging the fact that we are his obedient servants. And yet, not worthy. But here we are. I am yours, dear Lord. So again, it is so important, again, especially in the day and the age in which we find ourselves with so much emphasis on bowing the knee, especially during the pledge of, or the national anthem, I should say, people using bowing the knee as a protest. And yet here, St. Paul rightfully points out that we who call ourselves as Christians should bow our knees before our Heavenly Father. For elsewhere it says, this time, in the Epistle to the Romans, chapter 14, verse 11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Friends, ultimately, and I... I was just having this conversation the other day. Again, it seems like evil is so rampant in the world. Evil is just spreading its wings throughout the world in so many ways. Why, why is this? I, I don't understand, Father Todd. Why is this possible and how is this happening? And I responded because it's so true. In every war, you will have battles won and you will have battles lost. But simply because you've lost a battle does not mean that the war is lost. Satan has his way in the world right now. But ultimately, ultimately, the war will be won and God will be victorious because God will not be mocked. That's why this verse in Romans is so apropos because ultimately every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that God is indeed the Lord. Again, in Acts chapter 2, verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. At the name of Jesus. Those of you who have seen me preach in person and those of you who even watch these videos, those of you who are observant, probably notice that whenever our Lord's name is mentioned, I bow my head in reverence and respect. Oh, that is something, a practice that I wish it would start again throughout the world. Just the opposite is true. People, whether it be in person, in our own hearing, range, whether it be on TV or in movies or even written down in social media for that matter, people take our Lord's name as a curse. They blaspheme our blessed Lord's names. And the most pitiful part of it is most of these people don't even realize that they're doing it because they've never been taught that they shouldn't do it to begin with, number one. And number two, now they've developed such a habit of it, they don't even realize they're doing it. But I digress. 
Let's move on now, a couple verses later. In verse 16, St. Paul uses a very unusual terminology. He says, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Let's see if I can find here. Here it is. I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by the Spirit in the inner man. What does this term mean, the inner man? St. Paul is referring to, if you will, three aspects, namely the reason, the conscience, and the will as what the inner man is. The reason, specifically speaking, is St. Paul, and again, keep in mind, let me just again emphasize what we spoke about earlier, St. Paul is writing in a time where there was great chaos throughout the world. There was great division throughout the world. And there was great apathy. People do not care one way or another because they're looking out for themselves. Sound familiar? And so as a result, St. Paul is, it, it is his fervent desire. It is his fervent wish. He is hoping that his spiritual children at Ephesus, and also us as well, 2,000 years later, that claim the name Christian, we would be able to discern again through reason, discern between what is right and what is wrong. So true today, again, and uh, it, it's, it saddens me. I, I can't believe that it's happening because when I was younger, there seemed like there was at least a, a strong sense of this is right and this is wrong. Like, for example, here late, especially the past few days, I've seen a multitude of videos and so forth on social media uh, showing destruction of churches and vandalism of churches and destructions of the Sacred Heart statues and this, that, and the other. And people spray pa painting Nazi swastikas and this and that and the other on churches. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, oh. When I was growing up, I, you might have been a mass murderer, uh, but you you would you wouldn't deface a church or rob a church. There there were just certain things you don't cross the line on. Today there seems to be uh, it's just you know fling open the door, anything goes. And so as a result, St. Paul wishes that we could have a strong sense of what is right and what is wrong. Second, have a conscience. Following up on reason again and knowing what's right and what is wrong, so too with the conscience. St. Paul was afraid that consciences were dulled greatly. And so as a result, he wanted consciences to be sharpened. And so as a result, we too, as members of the church, we need to stand up for our conscience when we see something wrong, to speak out against it. When we hear about something not right, we should do our best to be against it and not have a sense of apathy and not caring. 
the third thing that St. Paul is referring to when he uses this term, the inner man, he's talking about the will. So often, and again, I'll preach to myself right now because I've experienced this various times in my life, unfortunately, as I'm sure you have too, but I'll just preach to myself right now. So often, even in times when we know something is right or something is wrong, clearly, we do not have the will to speak out against it, to say anything about it, to take a stand. Today, more than ever, dear friends, we need to have the will to stand up for our convictions, for what we know is right and wrong to have reason that God has given each of us to use to discern what is right and what is wrong and to have a conscience. Friends, St. Paul wishes for us the same thing that he wished for the church at Ephesus 2,000 years ago in a time of utter chaos and disruption and division in the world, which each of those things are used as tools by Satan to draw us away from God. St. Paul wants us, as he stated, to have the fullness of God in our lives so that we will not be filled with the things of the world but filled rather with things of God so that we will truly acknowledge his glory, his greatness, his grandeur, so that we will acknowledge him as our personal king of our life and to pledge him allegiance, show our obedience to him. And so this day, dear friends, I ask God to bless each and every one of you, to bless your friends, your family, your loved ones, to bless your towns and your cities, and to make this whole world again, to bring it under the rule of our Heavenly Father, that God will continue to bless each and every one of us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let me take just an extra moment or so to remind all of you that should you want to get in touch with receiving the Word, we'd be delighted to hear from you. Here's our website, www.encouragementfortoday.com. That's www.encouragementfortoday.com. Or write us at 829 Northeast Chester Avenue, Topeka, Kansas, 66616. That's 829 Northeast Chester Avenue, Topeka, Kansas, 66616. Knowing what a big difference encouragement makes in a person's life, you will not only find Father Todd's Sunday sermons, but also other assorted podcasts audios, and devotional blogs that will be a help in your faithful walk with the Lord. And that will help you take heart when the going gets tough and the way feels long. I'm Father Francis Dominic, and on behalf of Father Todd Braggs and Receiving the Word, thanks for listening.